Last week I made a video and it turned out to be kind of fun making that. So uh, it's that has sort of indirectly led me to what I'm doing now. Um, I decided to do a little excursion and I find myself currently on the Utah Nevada border on Highway 50. Uh, Highway 50 was uh, dubiously named the loneliest road in America courtesy of a Life uh, magazine article uh, many moons ago because uh, it goes through some pretty barren areas. Uh, the Nevada Board of Tourism sort of uh, took that as a badge of honor rather than the negative that it was supposed to be and uh, they've kind of ran with it and uh, kind of made Highway 50 uh, sort of a tourist destination. Matter of fact they even have the Highway 50 uh, survival guide, sort of a tongue-in-cheek thing. That's uh, where I'm at right now. I'm about to start my journey and uh, start heading, uh, heading west. Let's see what Highway 50, the loneliest road in America, has to offer. Starting from the east, you're greeted with the Border Inn, which lives up to its name by straddling the Utah-Nevada border. A uh, motel on the Utah side, gas station, bar, slots on the Nevada side, so the fun side. From there, it's a short drive uh, to Baker, which is the community that is the gateway to the Great Basin National Park. If you knew that the Great Basin National Park existed, go ahead and raise your hand. Now go ahead and lower that because you're a filthy liar. Nobody knew that was a national park. Aside from being a great place for astronomers, the park is known for the Lehman Caves, but the tour guide wanted to make sure and let you know about the astronomy part. If you want to see stars sooner than tonight, <laughs> don't, don't duck your head. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the Lehman Caves were pretty cool, both literally and figuratively. Uh, aside from being a nice reprise from the 100 degree heat, uh, the formations were really cool, the tour guide was really engaging, uh, and all the stuff was just interesting, flat out interesting. So if you're ever in the area, which most people aren't, uh, stop by, I highly recommend it. I'd also recommend the Wheeler Peak Scenic Drive. Uh, it's a 12 mile road that winds its way up the mountains uh, and it's really scenic provided you're not the driver. Unfortunately, I was the driver. Luckily, there's a lot of places to stop, uh, take a look, take some pictures. Uh, you can see a lot of varied landscapes, something you wouldn't necessarily uh, imagine for the Nevada desert. Uh, like right now, I'm in a forest. Who'd have thought? Uh, Wheeler Peak, if I'm not mistaken, is the tallest peak in Nevada. It even has a glacier on it. A glacier which I was bummed to not see until I did a little research after the fact and noticed it was right in front of me the whole time. From there, it was back on the road, on my way towards a town just a little over an hour away. But first, a slight detour. Off the main highway about five miles on a dirt road just outside the, the next town was the Ward Charcoal Oven State Park. They use these big ovens to make, you guessed it, charcoal. While mildly interesting, I'm gonna chalk this one up as the first dud of the trip. I now find myself here in Ely, Nevada, the closest thing to a metropolis that I've seen for hundreds of miles. Ely got its start as a mining town in the late 1800s, and the town's history seems emphasized by various photos that I've seen in a couple of the businesses that I've been in, as well as various murals throughout the city like this one of the charcoal ovens and this one of a cattle drive. And although its history dates back to the late 1800s, many of the buildings in town seem to be from the early 20th century, including the Hotel Nevada, where I'm staying. Built in 1929, it was the tallest and first fireproof building in Nevada at the time. It also served as a stopover for early Hollywood elite on their way to vacationing in Idaho. But with history and charm, there can be some drawbacks. Aside from the mining, Ely did have one other factor to play into its history. Now, you better believe that I would find a way to incorporate a railroad into my plans. Uh, this is the Nevada Northern Railroad in Ely, Nevada. The railroad was used to transport for the nearby mines that put Ely on the map in the first place but the railroad helped by linking the town with the Transcontinental Railroad some 150 or so miles to the north. But gone are the days of transporting for the mines, and now the railroad is used to treat passengers to 90 minute round trips featuring either a diesel engine or a steam engine. And given the chance, I couldn't pass up riding on an old steam train even if it meant turning my head when we went through the tunnel to avoid getting cinders in my eyes and subsequently reporting my shoulder for half the time. And then it was back on the road. I now find
find myself here in Eureka, which, much like Ely, has its history as a mining town. Uh, Unfortunately, there wasn't much to see since the town's attractions like the courthouse, the opera house, and the museum were all closed for the day. But it wasn't a total loss, as one of the shopkeepers told me about some petroglyphs further down the road on the direction I was going. So I'm gonna fork in the road. One time-consuming bad decision later, I was finally able to see some petroglyphs. Dating back thousands of years from the natives that lived in the Great Basin area. My experience wasn't the greatest with them, but uh, it was partially my own fault. Uh, but it'd be like giving a bad Yelp review because I wasn't hungry that day that I went to the restaurant. So I'm not going to fault it. It's a pretty cool place. Had I made the right decision, I would have had more time at the actual petroglyphs and I would have probably enjoyed myself a little bit better. But still, pretty interesting place. Uh, kind of cool seeing history like that. The first two days on 50 were pretty light, but heading west from Ely, including Eureka, was going to be the lion's share of the mileage. has its history to the late 1800s as, you guessed it, a mining town. For being a small town that it is now, uh, it has the oldest Catholic church in the state as well as the oldest bank building. So, hey, it's got that going for it. And not much open though right now, so I don't know if that's normal or if it's just, but this is Austin, Nevada. Continuing west and passing through some salt flats just outside the eastern edge of town, you reach Fallon, Nevada. A town that doesn't owe its history to mining, but instead agriculture. Now, unfortunately, since it was late in the day, I didn't get to check out much of the town, but just my first impression was it was a little larger than the other ones and hence lacked a little bit of the charm. So I guess my takeaway from Fallon will be this random barbecue place I stopped at. For many stretches, Highway 50 runs concurrently with the Lincoln Highway. Now, this was the first designated uh, road across the country, even predating Route 66. Designated around 1913, the Lincoln Highway predates even the Lincoln Memorial by almost 10 years uh, as the first national monument uh, designation for the slain president. The highway is identified by red, white, and blue signs or the much less conspicuous concrete markers that dot the length of the route. Highway 50 and its predecessor, the Lincoln Highway, loosely follow the old Pony Express Trail which, interestingly enough, only lasted a little over a year, not even two, but yet it's in all the history books. Uh, there's a couple stops along the way that kind of highlight some of the things. This one's just outside of a little outpost called Cold Springs. These roads, uh, they cut across the Nevada desert just like the old Pony Express riders did uh, over a century ago, a century and a half ago. So I find myself here at the shoe tree. Apparently this is not the original shoe tree. I guess that was cut down a few years ago by vandals. So this is the reborn version. Uh, I guess the story goes that the original shoe tree began uh, when a young couple got into an argument and the young man uh, decided uh, in his infinite wisdom to toss her shoes in the tree where the shoe tree was born. And then uh, people come, toss their shoes, I guess. It's surprisingly creepy. But here it is in the middle of the Nevada desert, uh, a shoe tree. Just a couple of miles down the road, you reach Middlegate Station, a quirky little outpost that harkens back to the days of the Pony Express as a changing point, as well as the various stagecoach lines over the years. Today, it serves as a place for weary travelers to escape the heat for a burger and a beer. And it's seen its fair share of folks as evidenced by the numerous dollar bills tacked to the ceiling. Middlegate Station, a nice little oasis. As my Nevada miles were dwindling, so was my daylight, but I still had to stop. So now I find myself just outside of Carson City in a tiny town called Dayton, and I'll give you uh, three guesses, without reading the sign behind me, of what put this town on the map. That's right, mining. In this case, it was gold mining. 
and uh, apparently from this sign, uh, this is where they first discovered gold in Nevada. That's kind of cool. Unfortunately, the place I wanted to stop was closed anyway, so I breezed through Carson City in a final sprint to the finish line. Just a few miles shy of the border, I was treated to a pretty nice sunset over Lake Tahoe before unceremoniously driving past the hardly marked California border. But I knew where I was once I saw a gas station and its prices. So this is where Highway 50 Nevada uh, culminates here in Lake Tahoe. Uh, came in uh, yesterday around sunset and I drove right by the sign. Didn't even see it. Rather than end it on the street uh, in front of Harrah's, I figured why not end it here with Lake Tahoe. Well, this concludes my journey across Nevada on Highway 50, America's loneliest road. All along the way, even though I haven't been emphasizing it, I've had my Highway 50 survival guide in hand. At various uh, businesses or tourist attractions in the towns, you get stamps and collect the stamps in your booklet. And I just wanted to say thanks for joining, thanks for watching. I hope you had as much fun uh, watching these as I had making them. Uh, if you did like them, let me know. Um, whether you did or didn't probably won't matter. I'll probably do this again because I did have so much fun making these. But if not, uh, bare minimum, I hope you learned a little something. I hope you got, got a glimpse of a part of the country that you probably never even heard of before. Thanks again, and uh, I guess I'll see you the next time.